All right, welcome back to another episode of the Hit Bombs podcast. Uh, welcome back, my co-host Victor Bourget. Uh, today we're going to be talking to one of the leading biomechanists in golf, Dr. Sasha McKenzie, who has his PhD in sports biomechanics. Uh, most notably, he has helped Matt Fitzpatrick gain a lot of speed. We know he won the 2023 U.S. Open at Brookline. Uh, also co-founder of the Stack System, a product that both me and Vic use heavily. Uh, Vic, what do you think about this guest? Really excited for it, yeah. I mean, Sasho invented the Stack System. I've used that, had a lot of luck using it and gaining speed. So uh, excited to hear more from him. I've watched a lot of his videos that he's got up on his website, and he does a, a really thorough job explaining a lot of things. So. I mean, selfishly, you know, for my game and my speed, uh, I want to talk to him. But hopefully you guys, the viewers, also, you know, get some value from it. Anything in particular you want to kind of talk to him about? Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious since I've used the app myself. Um, just curious to hear, like, what does the data look like on the back end? They've done this with thousands of golfers. So I kind of want to know what uh, what are the big findings from that? It seems like a really really cool uh kind of science experiment and i was happy to be a guinea pig, guinea pig there so yeah so yeah you have to say about that what, what about you yourself what about you well i think for me you know i first off i i have a lot of respect for saw show uh he's someone that i always go to when i have questions about stuff first and foremost he's an, an awesome guy <laughs> super super uh, generous with his time to me so very appreciative of that um but you know obviously you want to talk a little bit about uh his background the evolution of the stack system, uh, get into uh, his journey with Matt. I'm also very intrigued about how a, a PJ Tour player like Matt, who did put a lot of emphasis on speed training, uh, how they manage that throughout the, the different parts of the year, especially when they're on the road and they're trying to get their bodies to peak for certain events. Um, and then last but not least, Sasho, uh, I believe he does some consulting for major league teams. So um, I'm a big baseball fan. I love watching the correlation of the movements of batters and pitchers. Um, and it's just curious to see kind of where that world is going and, and how it's being compared to golf. So super excited for this. Um, I think without further ado, let's bring him in, huh? What do you think, Vic? Yeah, I mean, this is episode two of, of Bomb Talk and the SWAT team hasn't showing up at our doors yet at least not mine so a bomb talk so are we going, are we going with bomb talk i i think by default we're going with it until we get arrested well let's uh <laughs> or or the viewers want something else i don't know yeah, leave a comment below we'll keep it open-ended uh without further ado sasha mckenzie all right welcome back to another episode of the hit bombs podcast uh we still haven't come on up come up with a name yet uh Victor Bourget will be my, my co-host today. Also joined by one of golf's leading sports biomechanists, Sasha McKenzie. Welcome to the show. Nice nice to be on the show, Josh. Thanks for having me. Now, we've, we've known each other for a couple years now. Um, and when, when did we meet? At the PGA show a couple years ago? Yeah, that's right. Two, I think two years, two years ago at the PGA show in Orlando. Yep. I think we were on the open forum together. Um, and... You are currently the uh, PhD sports biomechanist up at STFX University in Canada. Is that That's right. correct? That's right. Same, yeah, St. Same Francis Xavier University in, in Nova Scotia. Okay. So uh, most notably, you are a co-founder of the, the Notorious Stack System and also played a significant role with Matt Fitzpatrick in winning the U.S. Open a few, year, few years ago up in Boston. Um, so tell us a little bit about your background. I know you came from track and field background. How, how did you get into golf? Yeah, well, um, my uh, golf uh, as an athlete was more, more of a hobby growing up in high school. Um, you know, I was a decent player. Um, single digit handicap and nothing impressive at all still nothing impressive but um i did my phd thesis on customizing shaft stiffness to a golfer's swing so um my, my research from early on uh, was very much linked to golf um and you know i started doing some consulting for uh pga tour coaches and i started working with some players 
developed some software for Ping, do a lot of consulting for them and for FootJoy. Um, so, you know, golf instructor education. Um, uh, yeah, kind of uh, got a passion for putting, passion for just performance in, in general in golf. That's awesome. And um, most notably, what you had a background in, in track and field, correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, competed in track uh, university. I was a coach for about 10 years. Um, spent, I probably spent more time teaching people how to do uh, Olympic lifts and, and run faster and jump higher than anything with golf so far. Spent, spent a good chunk of my life doing that. Um, yeah, so, you know, really took a lot of the principles from track and field and applied it to golf training. So where, where did uh, speed training start to intrigue you? Well, I, you know, I think I had that the track and field part of my life that was, you know, kind of compartmentalized. Um, you know, it, it didn't really apply it much to, to golf initially because I was more on the, you know, the, the, the training, improved performance side, more of a holistic approach with track and field, um, working directly with athletes. And then when I, you know, would do golf stuff, it was mostly focused initially on biomechanics. You know, I'd work with a tour player and I would say, okay, here, you know, here are the fundamental things you, you could do to improve uh, your club head speed based on biomechanics. Um, but that, that can only get you so far um, and, and, and realize that, hey, you know what, let's, let's apply some of these track and field principles in particular over speed and overload training. There was some products around at the time. I didn't think they were doing a great job philosophically of applying the science correctly to overload and overspeed training. Um, and I saw an opportunity to, to, to be a little more refined um, in that approach, hence the stack. Awesome. Yeah, and, and, and I agree. I think there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding about it out here, and hopefully we could clarify some of that today. Um, but before we get into the science of that, let's let's first talk about the evolution of the stack system. Um, obviously, you saw a need. You co-founded it with uh, Marty Jurdson, who uh, works over at Ping. Great, great player. Talk about that process. Yeah, so, you know, I kind of process started, I guess, almost 10 years ago now where I started doing um, – applying the philosophy of overload and overspeed training that I would take to golf, but in an experimental way. So, okay, um, we want to swing our driver faster. I know how fast I can swing my driver or a particular athlete can swing their driver. What loads can I introduce that are lighter than the driver that have, you know, center mass closer to the hands, lower moment of inertia, lower overall mass, so that I swing it a little bit faster. And you try to figure out, okay, well, how, how much faster is too fast to see benefits, right? So if, if I swing my drive at 100 miles an hour, do I want to be swinging this loaded or, you know, unloaded implement at 110? Do I want to be swinging at 125? What is the sweet spot? Do I want to have a bit of a mix? So it started doing fundamental research around that, looking at the speeds. And then the more nuanced, the more challenging aspect is getting at overload. So it's not as simple as, oh, let's just swing something that's a certain percent heavier. In weightlifting, for example, it's much more straightforward. If you've got a, a, a barbell that weighs 100 pounds and you lift it doing a bench press, bicep, curl, shoulder plus, whatever you're doing, um, you have a certain stimulus, stimulus X from that on the muscle. If you double the load of the barbell, you go from 100 to 200 pounds, the stimulus has also doubled. It's very easy. You know, I got the 40 pound dumbbells. Now I grab the 80, I've doubled it. With overload training in golf, it's not that simple because the movement is so dynamic and things change over time during the movement. You need to say, okay, well, I've got 20 grams loaded on the end of the stack. If I add an extra 100 grams, that doesn't increase the load that I'm experiencing by 100 grams. It, it increases it by some not obvious amount. So we need to do inverse dynamics in, in, in my lab to actually figure out, right, when Josh swings his driver, these are the forces and torque profiles we get with his driver. We want to figure out how do we load the stack so we just slightly increase those forces and torques at certain points in the swing so that he gets the appropriate level of stimulus to maximize his speed increases. So basically, you're talking about the force velocity curve here, if I'm not mistaken, correct? That the, the for, that's part of it. The force velocity curve, um, uh, we call it a force velocity uh, profile um, for a particular athlete. So when someone starts with the stack, we got 30 possible weight combinations. 
We do a baseline session and we have you swing things that are lighter in your driver and heavier in your driver. And we see where your relative deficits are. Are you someone that, you know, is really good at swinging lighter stuff and not so great at fa- swinging heavier stuff? Um, and, and that will dictate the program that we recommend to you. So that's, that, that's where we kind of call the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the force velocity profile of a person. It, it, and it can change over time. Um, and when it does change, the algorithms in our app will adapt to give you different combinations of, of overload and overspeed. And, and where that came from is some of the, initially, was some of the earlier research to be like, hey, this group of people seems to really respond better to overload training. Everybody will respond to both, but for some reason, wow, Josh, you know, seems to be like he adapted really well when we did heavier stuff. Victor, he seemed to adapt really well when we did overspeed stuff. What is it? What, you know, then you go back and look at the data. What is it with these people that has them be more susceptible to increases from particular types of training? And what came out was this force velocity profile. We could see that, well, on the, on the outset, Josh was struggling with this particular condition. Victor was struggling with this other condition. Let's target that a little bit more. Yeah, just a follow up there on that. Uh, so you're doing a lot of research in the lab, uh, you know, I imagine. And uh, just I've, I've worked with the app before on the stack and it's really, you know, intuitive and, and straightforward. And um, so I imagine you're getting a lot of like research and, and test data from the actual users of the stack itself, too. So like, do you have any um, any kind of interesting findings or surprises that you've you've learned just looking at the data potentially? Yeah, oh, yeah, lots of weird things. I mean, we're we're constantly updating the programming based on our findings. So, you know, the the from everything from I'll share one one particular insight, but everything from is twenty seconds rest between swings better than fifteen seconds rest. Should you should you do four sets of six or three sets of eight? So those those questions are are very difficult to answer in a small scale in, in a lab like I'm in where you have 30 people in each group because the differences are going to be small. You know, just like if you were lifting weights, is three sets of eight better than four sets of six? Well, you know what I mean? It's going to come out in the wall. It's going to be pretty close. We're talking minimum, both are going to get stronger. But with the stack system, we have thousands and thousands of people using it. We can compare groups of hundreds to see what rest times are more effective? What breakdown of sets and reps? Is it better to do overspeed before overload? Um, so w- one interesting thing that came out was initially we have some single arm protocols. So there's some people whose lead arm or trail arm is literally just getting drug along in the swing. It's not contributing. It's actually, um, you know, just dead weight. So if, if you test out in the baseline session that says, right, this is definitely a limitation for you, Victor, then we're going to put you in the um, uh, trail arm enhancer program, for example. Initially, that program was 18 sessions. But thanks to all this data we were collecting, we, we could see, and the app displays is lovely for us in the back end with our database, is that people would make up that differential in 12 sessions. And then that continued single arm training from sessions 13 to 18 was really having no added benefit um, for people who were just trying to close that gap. So now we've switched those programs to being only 12 sessions. Uh, that's just one example of, of, of lots of, you know, interesting Im- information. There's some, there's some really obscure ones, you know, that I find particularly interesting. Um, uh, 90, uh, 90% of all golfers are right-handed. Right. And if we look at those right handed golfers of that 90 percent, 95 percent of them are right hand dominant. They would throw with their their right hand. Um, But if we look at the 10 percent of golfers that play left handed in our database of about 50,000 people, it's split 50 50 between whether they would throw with their left hand or their right hand. That's an interesting kind of like, you know, why, why, why does that, you know, that's neither, you know, here, here nor there. Um, and then you can get into something that's a little bit more practical where if your dominant arm is your lead arm. So if you're a right-handed golfer, I'm not sure how the video is coming through in the screen, but if you're a right-handed golfer, you play golf right-handed, you throw with your right hand, Okay, Um, that means that this is your trail hand. There's going to be no 
overall discrepancy in that group with whether they're faster single arm swings with their lead or their trail. If your lead hand on the club is the dominant hand, then you're much more likely to have that be your fastest single arm swinging hand. So a right-handed golfer who throws with their left, there's very strong odds that they'll swing the club much faster with their lead arm only than their trail arm only. So, <laughs> Sasha, when you, when you talk about overspeed and, and overload, obviously it, it has to do with one, one person swinging a lighter object or one person swinging a heavier object. What are some of the variables that you see uh, categorize people into either or? How, yeah, how do you well, need some, uh, you know, one or the other? Yeah, everybody, everybody will benefit from both to some degree. Um, they work on different mechanisms in the system. And this comes from, uh, you know, it's not new to golf, not new to our research. We're just building on what's been done with um, jumping, for example. So studies will show that, hey, loaded jump squats, right? Um, if you do reps with 80 pounds on your back or a percentage of your mass, Hey, you'll, your vertical jump goes up after training. If you have a bungee cord attached to you, right? So now you're doing overspeed training with jumping. Everybody in that group also will increase their vertical, but there will be certain people that will get more benefit from overload, certain people that will get more benefit from overspeed. Um, and, and that's where we would look at, for us, the, the driver is the reference, Right. And then we can look at the speeds you swing things slightly heavier in your driver, the speeds you swing things slightly slower in your driver. We put you into percentiles. So if you're someone that has really high percentiles with heavier stuff, then you're probably going to benefit more from the overspeed training. You struggle with the lighter stuff. And then it gets even more nuanced when we start to look at the swings of those individuals. It's, it seems, in addition to the neuromuscular capabilities of the person. There seems to be mechanical differences in their swing. People that do well with heavy weights are very good at using the ground, at getting energy speed developed in the system. So they get, they're good at using the ground to get speed into the system. Folks that are very good um, with lighter objects are good at getting the speed out to the club. Um, and so, you know, when we target overload or over speed, not only are we targeting a certain aspects of the neuromuscular system in a certain way, but we're also focusing on certain mechanics. So if you struggle with lag, you're better off working with lighter stuff. If you are struggling with, you know, using the ground appropriately, the overload conditions are probably better for you. So now, did you see any correlation? I know earlier in the podcast, you said you did your thesis on shaft flex and different profile shafts. Did you see any correlation between some of the data you guys found uh, with the overspeed, underspeed stuff uh, relative to different shaft profiles? No, it's it's um, as you could probably guess, um, it's very hard to predict a profile of someone who's going to swing faster with a more flexible shaft or a stiffer shaft. I'm sure you've you've played with some cr Hit, hit balls, very high ball speeds with very flexible shafts and very stiff shafts. Correct me if I'm wrong, Josh. I don't want to be putting words into your mouth. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the shaft has the ability to, to store energy that's initially generated by our muscles and then release it at impact. Um, so it doesn't create or add any more energy. And if, if you have a particular set of swing mechanics that allows you to that store and release that energy at the correct time, it, it probably doesn't matter um, what particular shaft flex you, you are using. Um, uh, you know, you're, what, what are, what kind of ball speeds are you generating these days, Josh? Yeah. Right or now, Victor? 220 range. 220. So my guess is with, a, with a little bit of, of practice, you could get, you know, let's say with a shaft that's not perfectly right for you, but with a little bit of practice, you might be 218 with the shaft that's really matched to your mechanics and a little bit of practice, 222. There's a lot of fuzz in there. You know, I'm assuming that you, you maybe you disagree or maybe that's not been your experience, but um, it certainly seems from the outside looking in on long drive, I see you guys use all sorts of <laughs> different shaft properties and have, have great success. Yeah. Um, well, on that note, we've, we've had a lot of conversations before. I know we've talked about this uh, in some of the content 
But we've had a lot of conversations on ball count and uh, reps. And, uh, we, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because in the long drive world, we see a lot of guys when they're training, they hit PRs uh, in the 150, 175 ball rep range. And from our conversations, that doesn't really make sense from a sports science standpoint, right? Yeah, you know, there's a couple of things going on here for sure, um, but certainly on the surface, it is very unintuitive. You know, you think of really explosive single belt repetition sports that take, you know, half a second for the rep to happen, like a long jump, a shot put, a javelin throw. Um, and, you know, there's no high jumper, for example, or shot putter that's going to be peaking on their 170th rep, you know, or you think, let's go, you know, baseball pitchers, right? I don't even know if a baseball could throw, could, you know, any pitcher who could throw that many balls without like, that's it, my season's over, um, right? Uh, and, and the same with, you know, track and field sprinting. So now, um, long drive is a unique event in that, you know, if you go to a high jump competition, you're not expected to do you know, 10 mini high jump competitions in two days. You know, I don't know ex some, some of your events you like, okay, I got a round in the morning, a round late morning, a round in the afternoon. Um, so there, there is some, in a weird way, some endurance aspect to the event that makes it unique. However, I think the, the, the biggest, there's two big issues for me in terms of from, from a scientific research perspective. One, it's, it's very early days. Um, and most people do the same thing, you know, so if you had every hundred meter sprinter back in the 1940s running 400 meters to get faster at the hundred, then no one would really, you know, kind of show up and be, be dominant. Like I'm doing something different. If you kind of follow me, I'm not, not, not putting any shade on long drivers, but it's early. It's early days in the, in the grand scheme of things for the sports. So if everybody's kind of doing this high rep training, and it's like, yeah, that's where we're kind of selecting from the same population. The, 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 the other interesting aspect to me is warm up. So if you take a look at a high jumper that's or a long jumper that's going to try to go out and set a PR that day, um, they're going to spend an hour warming up. They're going to start with a couple of, you know, two laps, two laps jogging around the track. I'm going to do dynamic stretching for probably 20 minutes. They're going to do, you know, 15 minutes of excels. They're going to do some hops and bounce. Like they're going to be raising their body temperature, gradually preparing the muscles to go. And so, you know, there are many movements, exercise patterns in before they would ever hit that peak. Right. Um, so I think, and this is just my theory and it could be, it could be wrong, but you know, my, my guess is, is that those first 60 balls aren't at absolute ballistic maximum effort thinking this is going to be my PR. Um, I would like to think that I could take either of you on this podcast and go, right, let's go warm up more like a sprinter. Let's go do a couple of laps jogging. Let's do some dynamic med ball tosses. Let's do some hops and bounds. Let's gradually start swinging, you know, with the stack when I'm hitting balls, we're increasing range of motion, gradually getting faster. And then, you know, finish with like 10, 10 swings, no ball, as hard as we can, just air swings. And be like, all right, I would predict that after that 45 minute to an hour warm up session, that within 20 balls, you're going to hit a PR. But if you're like, eh, you know, kind of roll out of the car, you know, do some whatever you're doing and then just kind of start hitting balls and your first 60 balls are at like 90 to 95 percent effort. Yeah. But I could be mis misconstruing what's what's going on in reality. That's my take. So do you think, do you think maybe a, a good percentage of those early balls are just guys getting warmed up and getting their body primed? That's my guess, just based on the body of, of, of evidence from other sporting activities. You know, there's, there's, I can't think of something where an athlete would have their peak performance 170 reps into something if all of those reps were maximum effort. D now, doesn't about, seem quite the, right. Now, what about the skill of actually swinging the club, right? I mean, obviously, repetitions, you might get more efficient from a movement standpoint. So is there is there a chance that even though your body might be declining, you're actually getting more efficient just through repetition? 
Yeah, I mean, that's that's a theory. Um, I don't see that holding up in any other sports either, though, right? They're, you know, swinging golf club is a complex movement. Um, so is t- tennis serving, uh, you know, so so is high jumps, very technical, um, the rotational technique and shot put, you know. So, um, yeah, yeah, maybe. I, the only the only analogy I can think of is kind of close as that sometimes the explanation you get for swimmers um, performing like really long uh, training sessions, lots of of distance covered, even though they might the race might only be twenty seconds. You know, um, this, I, that, that's sometimes the theory I hear is like, well, they want to get reps in to make sure that their you know their movements are more efficient. Slightly different. You know, but but there's a coordination theory there that let's get the reps in to make sure our stroke is better. Different in that it's not in that session that these swimmers expect to peak. You know, so um, I mean, I don't. I, does coordination improve that much within a session? Shoot, I, you know, I'd like to think that your technique is is pretty darn darn good. Where you know that you might you might get some. Uh, antagonistic co-contraction reduction, right? There's some kind of like weird fatigue thing going on. You, you know, um, it could just be a, a, a probability thing a little bit where, you know, you're looking for the maximum, maximum attempt and maybe, but that's sometimes then what happened within the first 10 swings. And, you know, then you might go 70 swings with low ball speeds and then, oh, 82, there's another awesome ball speed. So it, it doesn't, I get it, maybe worth exploring, but I don't see any much evidence in some in other things out there that says that your coordination would improve that much on your 170th rep. Fair enough, fair enough. So um, let, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, a couple years ago, Matt Fitzpatrick reached out to you, um, and obviously he wanted to increase his club edge speed. Uh, when did you got? When did he reach out to you, and what was what was that conversation like? Yeah, it was initially his coach, uh, Mike Walker, um, and and they had uh, realized that Matt had had reached a point in his career where he wanted to win majors. He wanted to march up, you know, be a top top ten player in the world, if not get to be the best player in the world. And they they'd go to a major, you know, he'd he'd won some DP World Tour events. Um, lots of aspects of his game are very tight, um, very very elite. But then, you know, they'd be at number 11 at Augusta um, and he would have a hybrid into the green and DJ has a nine iron. And it's like, OK, well, th- th- there's so much pressure on the rest of my game that, uh, that this isn't going to work out. Um, I need to gain some speed. Um, and so that's, you know, I, I went down for an initial session. We worked on s- mostly biomechanics. There was no stack stuff involved initially. Gun to his head. He probably couldn't swing any faster than 114 found some biomechanical uh, thoughts that, um, you know, and I'm not telling him, you know, forces and torques things, you know, it was like working a lot with Mike and him to know what their language was, how they communicated, taking my concepts of biomechanics, using their language to get Matt to try some things. Got him up to 116. He felt comfortable playing this on holes that suited a draw. Um, But you know, then, then, you know, the following fall, it was like, all right, let's, I bought, got some buy-in. Um, and then it's like, right, let's actually take these mechanical thoughts, combine it with some stack training. Um, that, that's where you're going to get your most bang for your buck is, is let's work on these movement patterns while we're also trying to adapt our neuromuscular system for speed. And, you know, that the, the year that he won the U S open, he started out, uh, pebble beach, Average tournament club at speed, you know, based on shot link was 113 miles an hour. And you could see it slowly tick up. And I've got an awesome graph where I pair it with the um, stack stimulus, you know. Um, so we get two Y-axis tournament club at speed on one, stack stimulus on the other so you can compare them. And he marched his way up from 113 to 118 uh, at the U.S. Open um, where he won, which was awesome. And then he continued to train and he had an average tournament club at speed uh, that summer in 2022 of uh, 121 miles an hour, 181 ball speed average for the, ter- the, the, t- the tournament at the Tour Championship, which is, um, you know, life changing if you're a professional golfer. 
Yeah, so so one thing we'll hear from from folks when they you know are thinking about undergoing speed training is, hey, I might hit the ball a little bit all over the place. So was that uh, what was that conversation like with Matt and and how did I guess how did that go accuracy yeah. wise? Yeah, well, that that was a, a major concern. So when I first uh, the first meeting, he was 19th in the world strokes gained off the tee. That's pretty darn elite. He's already an awesome driver of the golf ball. Um, but, uh, you know, I showed him a graph of the t- top 30 um, strokes gained off the tee individuals, uh, what their club head speeds were. He was like, <laughs> way d- like he didn't even fit in the group. And then, hey, what's your accuracy? And he was crazy accurate. So there's a major risk here that if we try to increase speed with this tour player who's a finely tuned machine with certain fields that, you know, Maybe he doesn't even get faster, but we, he loses control. For a while, he actually increased speed and got even more accurate. And this is was based on his um, stats from Eduardo Molinari, who runs uh, um, Matt's uh, statistical um, uh, side of his his, his performance. Uh, and there's a there's a simple explanation for that. If your max club head speed is 114, like gun to your head, warmed up at the Bears Club, 114, and you're playing at 112. You're at a very high percentage of your max. And he was still accurate at that level. But if we take your max to 120 and now you're playing at 116, you're playing at a faster speed, but you're actually swinging at a lower percentage of your max, right? So you're theoretically more in control. You know, this is, um, you know, reminds me of a a story or analogy I I like to um, explain to folks when, you know, it would have been three years ago now when Rory was, you know, um, looking at Bryson, who just won the U.S. Open the following summer. And Rory's like, yeah, I don't think I want to chase the speed thing because it wasn't going well for him. He could see Bryson on the course with about a 191 average ball speed. Rory is like, yeah, you know what? I can get it up there. His max ball speed is probably 195. So he can. He can get the ball up to 190, you know, at the time. Um, But he's swinging at such a high percentage of his max relative to Bryson. So it's going to be tougher to control. Bryson had just come off competing in the world long drive, you know, um, the, the fall before. And we know that he could get with his gamer driver that he plays on tour, 215 ball speed. So for Bryson to go out and have 190 ball speed, he's at less than 90% of his max. So him hitting 190 ball speed, it's like, it's like you guys hitting 190 ball speed, right? You're chipping it around. Um, so, but for somebody whose max is 195, all of a sudden 190 for their world that they're living in, that's really challenging. So the goal of the stack system is to raise your max so that you actually can swing faster from an absolute standpoint, but with a lower percentage of effort. Um, so really, you, you shouldn't be too concerned about increasing your dispersion if you follow that, that philosophy. Your dispersion might increase even if your accuracy stays the same, your face-to-path variability stays the same. The dispersion might increase just because you're further down the cone. But there's lots of research that's been done, you know, thanks to Mark Brody that shows, look, that distance um, is going to offset uh, the little bit of dispersion increase. So Sasha, you talked about, uh, you, you, you first looked at his biomechanics. How do you evaluate what he's currently doing, know what he's potentially capable of doing and then go, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to choose to work on this and I'm going to choose to not work on this. How do you sort of evaluate that, you know, so that you don't mess him up? Right. Yeah. Great question. So I have a a, a deterministic model in my head. Uh, Club head speed is fundamentally a bunch of equations based on what the golfer's doing. So if I know um, the length of your hand path, the force along the hand path, the angle the club rate rotates through, if you're looking at him face on, and the torque you apply over that angle... If I could measure that in my lab, but those are things I can see out on the course too, out on the range, those literally add up to club head speed. There's equations where I could, if, you, if I knew those values for you, Josh, I could say Josh swung that driver at, um, you know, 160 miles an hour. I would know that. So I can look at a golfer and say, he's got room to increase the length of his hand path. There's some things that we could do here to increase his average force along the hand path. Um, and I also, um, 
put that into the the perspective of does he have enough speed in the system to use those four factors to get it out to the club? That's where the ground reaction forces come in. So you only need a certain amount of speed from the ground. It's possible to overdo it. We aren't um, figure skaters where every little bit more amount of angular momentum we get by interacting with the ground helps us perform better in our sport. Um, and as long driver, long drivers, you, you're probably keenly aware of this because you have a, an incredible ability to use the ground. If you continued to use the ground as hard as you could to put angular momentum in the system, you would struggle to get that out to the club. An analogy I like to use is, uh, let's say, let's say you guys don't quite hit it off today after this podcast, Josh and Vic, you guys get into it about something, right? <laughs> and, and Josh and I are driving down the road and there's, there's Vic, he's walking on the sidewalk. I'm driving the car and Josh is in the passenger seat. Josh unlatches the door. He's like, Sasho, slide over here. I'm going to whack, I'm going to whack Vic with the door. So I'm like, yeah, you know what? Screw Vic. I don't like Vic either. And just as Josh is about to open up the door, I'm like, yeah, screw Vic. And I hit the accelerator. What's going to happen is that door is going to fold back in on Josh, even though there's more speed in the system. We now have more potential speed to hit Vic with the door. But by me trying to add speed into the system for too long, that actually inhibits Josh's ability to get it out to the door to hit, hit Vic. It would actually be slightly better if I tap the brake. That's going to create a system of forces at the hinges that actually allows Josh and I to get that speed out to the door. Um, and that's what we want to do in a golf swing. You know, we've got about 0.2 seconds at most to get angular momentum from the ground, you know, from using the ground into the system, and then we got to get it out. If we continue to try and get as much angular momentum in the system as we possibly can, that inhibits our ability to get it out. So when I'm looking at Fitzpatrick, I go, right, I don't need him swinging at 140 miles an hour. I need him swinging at 125 miles an hour, max. Beyond that, the, you know, beyond like 185 ball speed, there's very quickly diminishing returns for strokes gained. So I don't need him to be a long driver. I only need him swing at 125. Maybe his max club head speed gun to his head is like low 130s, and then he can cruise at 125. This is like down the road, right? From, but this is what my thought. Let's if we if we get him to 120, which we did, he just needs a certain amount of angular momentum in the system. He uh, was more of a horizontal torque golfer. He likes those feelings. Does not like. Um, being optimized to get angular momentum in the frontal plane. So I rule, tried, you know, for like five minutes, let's try this, let's try that. Things to maybe increase the amount of angular momentum in the system in the, in the, in the frontal plane, just for lots of reasons, they weren't going to work. He felt like if he shifted off the ball anymore, that he'd stay shifted off the ball. He gets stuck back there. Um, so to try and create more separation between the center mass and center pressure was just a no-go. So... I focused on, I thought, okay, he's got enough speed in the system. I just need to get more of it out to the club. And maybe we can get a little bit more speed in the system if we focus on the horizontal plane torques. So we come up with um, a few cues using the language that he uses with him and his coach, Mike, about how he could increase the force along the hand path. And, and, and that, that allowed him to get, get some, some more club head speed. What were uh, what were some of those cues, Sasha? Just out of curiosity, kind of just behind the scenes, what's the what's the language yeah. kind of look yeah. like with a PGA Tour coach and player? Right. So so you know, <laughs> whittled down a lot of ideas and got to this one that kind of works. So he loved to see the ball fade when I first started working. He wanted to see the ball fall from left to right. Um, if I had him do things with his lead foot. Or in the last half of the downswing through impact, that was going to increase the path of the club to the left. Might increase club at speed, but now it's kind of turning into a bit of a bit of a banana. Too too much curve on the ball. So we need to do something to get that path more to the right early. And there's an opportunity to say, okay, how do we get more force into the handle earlier in the swing? That's going to get the path more out to the right. So I said to him, hey, let's let's hit some big draws. I want you to feel like you just, let's see you slinging some draws. And he, he's talented, you know, so he's like, yeah, six path out to the right, seven, eight. He's hitting these big slingers. I'm like, okay, now 
I need you to your backswing and transition. All thoughts, big draw. As soon as you start down, though, as soon as that transition's done, as soon as you've got the club in the position you wanted to, and you just start down thinking draw, now I need you to rip that path over to the left. You need to hit a fade. You hate seeing the ball go from right to left. So you need to rip that club head as hard as you can to the left through impact. And you can't cheat. You can't, you can't cop out and not do that draw backswing, draw transition feeling, right? Um, and so then that added a jump in speed. Obviously, when you're training speed, it gets uh, pretty physically taxing on your body. Um, did you guys periodize Matt's work, for example, go heavier in the off season and then change that approach when he started traveling, going from tournament to tournament? Yeah, for sure. He, he, he was an awesome case study because relatively trained athlete does lots of reps, but he managed to gain meaningful speed, his most speed during the season from Pebble Beach uh, all the way through to the Tour Championship, you know, went from 113 uh, to 121 average tournament club head speed, doing a very minimal dose amount of, of stack training. Uh, a, a heavy week for him would have been 45 minutes. That would have been like 45 minutes of stacking would have been his heaviest week, and he probably only had a handful of those. Um, and then, you know, it could be as low as 20 minutes to, to you know, two 10-minute sessions, maybe a a 12 minute session, an eight minute session, just enough to keep things going. Um, I, I think it, it's tough to periodize for golf in general, you know, because we got four majors that are spread out over four months. doesn't really work out very well. And then you got the playoffs or the Ryder cup, you know, the, the guys really love the Ryder cup. So they're trying to peak multiple times in the year. So you kind of have to take a different approach than you would say with an Olympic athlete. Um, and it, I prefer prefer tour players, elite golfers, to think of it as, okay, what weeks am I not going to stack, right? Th this is a fundamental skill that I need to perform at the, the best level in golf. I need to have a high club at speed. It's very, very clear on the PGA Tour. So what am I going to do to maintain that skill and increase that skill throughout the entire season? Uh, I need to be stacking all the time. Where do I pull it out? Where do I go? I'm taking this two weeks off. I'm taking these three weeks off, you know, up to max of two months where you're not stacking. That, that's my philosophy. It's like if you are a soccer player, you need to be sprinting. That's a fundamental skill in soccer. Um, it's interesting in baseball right now, we're, I think we're going to go through a change. You see all baseball players, if you, if you look at the, the data, their bat speed at all, but 99% of them, bat speed decreases throughout the season. To me, that's something that should be addressed with, with, with appropriate training. You don't want right now in the off season where everything matters, you don't want your, your players to have their slowest bat speed. That doesn't make sense. When I was, I was actually going to ask you that you're, you're doing some consulting with some major league teams, correct? Yep. And, and so uh, I was told by someone else in the sports science world that the, the baseball world is about five years behind the golf world. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. Or, or where they're going? Yeah, for sure they are. Um, I, I, I feel pretty good about that. They were ahead in terms of statistics, um, you know, Moneyball. Um, they, they figured out, right, these are, the, these are the stats that are important, but where they're, they're lacking is, right, how do we get these stats? <laughs> right. So it's like, oh, yeah, the stats are saying that we need really high bat speed. That's very, that's very important. Right. Now how do we train for that? You know, um, and it's it's tough. There are a lot of traditional aspects to baseball, a lot of games. Um, they're hypersensitive to potential injury. Um, so there's a lot of obstacles to overcome to get people to commit to training. But it's a big league. Um, people want to perform their best. There are going to be some pioneer players who are going to do what's best to increase their bat speed. And you're going to see the shift just like you're seeing it in golf where, you know, it was like, half a mile per hour increase club head speed this year, none the next year, another half. And then all of a sudden this year, boom, right? People are starting to realize, oh yeah, I need to train for this. This is important. Do you see uh, club head speed related more to how pitchers train or compared to how batters train based off the recovery needed? Yeah, Definitely batters. I think having two hands on an object and being able to, um, you know, absorb that 
that that energy throughout more of the the system um, than just say what's going on in one shoulder and one elbow um, means that you can you can have higher volume of of repetition um, for sure. So uh, I put uh, I put I think swinging a golf club is more like swinging a bat, definitely. Well, I know you got to get going. I appreciate you coming on. I'm sure we'll we'll have many chats down the road. I, I appreciate all of our conversations. You've been a tremendous resource to me and someone I, I highly respect, uh, you know, in, in the industry. So thank you for that. And um, be sure to, if you guys want to uh, purchase your own stack system, we have a promo code that will pop up. Um, be sure to use that. And Sasho, thank you so much. Hopefully we'll see each other soon. Hopefully. Thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it, Sasha. All right, Vic. So uh, very intriguing. I feel like we could have talked to Sasha for uh, a, a long time today. I, I know he had to run, so I wanted to be respectful of his time. Um, but what, what were some of the things that you took away from what he talked about? Yeah, we're, we're for sure going to need a part two, three, four, and five, I'm guessing, with Sasha. But, uh, I mean, yeah, great conversation. I think one of the things I really – uh, was fascinated by was just hearing Matt's speed gains while it was during the PGA Tour season. So I know like myself when I'm trying to train speed and you know get busy in the summers with things, it's, it's hard. It's hard to find that time and then hard to find I guess the physical resources and recovery to actually be able to train and, and gain speed. So the fact he was able to do that during a PGA Tour season with a lot of money on the line and then to have it pay off uh, that, that was amazing. That was, that was a really cool story to hear. Yeah. And for me, it was, it was interesting hearing how he navigated that, right? I've, um, been fortunate to have a, a few PJ tour guys reach out to me, um, and ask for speed training advice. And it's, it's always a fine line, right? Because these guys, uh, their career is on the line. They have, uh, it's their job. They have their families depending on it, you know, and, uh, if you, tell him something wrong and then he goes and plays bad and eventually loses his card, right? You just uh, basically had a significant effect on him, right? So it's always an interesting thing to hear how uh, different people at an elite level navigate, you know, especially the coaching front. Um, you know, talking about the the overspeed and the overload training was really interesting, right? Um, you know, in terms of how one benefits a certain individual and the opposite benefits another individual. Uh, well, how about you? You've done a lot of training with the stack. Have you responded better to overspeed or overload? Uh, for me, it's overspeed. Yeah, just just teaching the body how to go fast. And then uh, that's that's been more successful to me. I think I have a tendency with, with the overload at least to – it might be a little harder on my joints and, and wrists when I get up at higher speeds and higher loads. So um, just personal preference, probably just on how I load the club. But it, what, what about you? Yeah, I, 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 I think I would agree. I think generally speaking, I've uh, responded a little bit better, um, you know, uh, by, by some of the overspeed stuff. Um, I do have a couple of friends, though, right, who uh, it's like the heavier – the object is the better they swing it and the faster they move it. Um, and that's why I asked a question about different shafts and the correlation, because there is a couple of long drivers out there that actually uh, swing it faster with a heavier grip, heavier shaft, stiffer shaft setup. So it's, it's just kind of interesting, the correlation of everything. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think too, like, I mean, you've seen my swing too. I think the cool part about the speed training, over speed, under speed, and using these instruments is like, at least for me, my, my swing looks a lot better when I'm using and doing over speed training. So trying to figure out how to blend that into the actual swing too. So I think there's mechanics benefits there yeah. beyond just like central nervous system firing faster. Yeah. Vic, Vic is the person that uh, swings a speed stick and his, his swing is absolutely perfect. And then you put a ball down, and I don't know what changes, uh, but I think we got to do a, a a brain transplant or something with you, Vic. I I got to get hit over the head really hard. I mean, again, but you know that's probably how it started. But agreed. So, well, anyways, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that podcast. We're gonna try to keep it going. Um, we're not gonna 
pump these out every week. We want to try to make sure that the guests we have on, you know, is valuable. We don't want to waste anyone's time out there. Uh, and I thought Sasha was definitely a, a great person that fit that mold. Um, if you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel. It alerts you every time we release new content and then uh, leave a comment below. Let us know who else you want to hear, uh, you know, on the podcast. It's something that uh, I really am enjoying doing. And I think hopefully at the end of the day, it brings a lot of value to you guys at home. We'll see you next time. Hitbombs.com.